Hello, welcome to Strictly Money at the News Forum. I'm Sajal Patel. Numerous studies show that when it comes to life and health insurance, a majority of Canadians are underinsured. In fact, more than half of Canadians still do not have life insurance. And with the rising cost of living in debt, now you may be thinking that this is not the time to be buying protection. However, this could actually be the time when you need it the most. Joining me now with his advice on how much insurance you need and how to save money is Jason Heath. He is a fee-only financial planner with Objective Financial Partners. Jason, great to have you back on and, and Happy New Year. Thanks, Nigel. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that um, so many people underestimate the need for protection and, and see it as a mm -hmm. financial burden when it could actually save them from it. For sure. And, and look, I'm, you know, I'll admit as a financial planner, I appreciate the importance of insurance, obviously, but I've got a bunch of personal and business insurance policies that uh, renew in January. Um, so I'm just paying those premiums right now and I pay my premiums annually because that tends to reduce the cost by about six to nine percent versus paying monthly. And I'm feeling the pain, especially after the holidays. But I think that one of the biggest challenges with cutting out a cost like insurance is you don't really need insurance until you do need it. And if you cut it out or you're underinsured or whatever the case may be, the financial burden can be significant, not only for your family, but also for yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's a cost to buying protection, right? And, and people are trying to save money. In your experience, Jason, do you think people are buying less protection to save money or could they just be buying the wrong type of protection, you know, with, with all the bells and whistles and the riders and, and they're buying so much more than they yeah. actually need? Well, sometimes I, I think it is a case of buying the wrong type of insurance. Uh, insurance, Generally, when insurance is expensive, not all the time, but usually when it's expensive, it's because you're insuring a risk that is um, likely to happen or um, it's it's a big potential benefit or payout. And just to give an example, to buy a life insurance policy when you're 25 years old is cheap because you're not likely to die. The life insurance policy is not likely to pay out. But buying a disability insurance policy when you're 25 years old that could potentially pay you out every year for the next 40 years if you were to become disabled um, can be very expensive on a relative basis. So I find a lot of people um, opt for life insurance and ignore other types of insurances. But uh, definitely there are life insurance products out there that are more expensive because there are bells and whistles, there's investment components. And I think for the vast majority of Canadians, that's not the right type of life insurance for them to be buying. Yeah, so let, let's get into that because term insurance is, is I know, a popular one. It's certainly cheaper when it, when it comes to premiums. Um, when does sure. it make sense for someone to buy term insurance? So term life insurance, just to, to clarify, is a type of insurance you buy for a five-year term or a 10-year term or a 20-year term, for example, and um, the premiums stay the same during the term. And as long as you pay those premiums, if you die during that term, there's a death benefit that pays out to your beneficiaries. Um, and that type of insurance, I think, is really important when you have people that are dependent upon you financially, whether it's a spouse, whether it's children. Oftentimes, people will recommend to get life insurance when you're young because it's cheap, um, even to buy a life insurance policy for a young child, for example, because they'll have it when they grow up. I'm not so sure about that. I think the, the main reason to go out and buy life insurance, especially term life insurance, is when you're working and you have people who, who are dependent on you financially. Yeah, um, we only have about 45 seconds to the break. So um, when it does make sense, so if you have children, because I know I've seen situations where they're like, okay, you know, my kids will be financially independent by the time they're 25. So term insurance only mm -hmm. makes sense for uh, until that point. That's that's a reasonable sure. argument. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that uh, within, you know, five years of retirement, for example, might become 
self-insured. In other words, they're financially independent. And if something happened to them, their spouse or their kids would be okay because the kids are off the payroll and they're pretty close to being retired and financially independent anyways. So not everybody needs life insurance forever. And oftentimes as you approach retirement, it's time to consider whether you have uh, too much coverage. Okay, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Jason, we've been talking about the different types of life insurance. So um, we talk about term insurance. The other type of insurance um, obviously has the, the savings and the investment component to it, which can be whole life or, or universal life. What are, the, what are the pros and cons to this? Right. So um, again, with, with term life insurance, term life insurance is an insurance you buy for a specified term. You often um, don't renew it as you get closer to retirement or, or into retirement, as long as your health is good. Uh, some people will buy um, permanent insurance, which is generally meant to keep for your whole life. Um, that type of insurance often has an investment component or generally has an investment component. There's two primary types, whole life insurance, where um, the investment component is not selected by you. There's sort of a, a, a pool of investments that your extra premiums beyond what's needed to, to cover the, the pure cost of insurance uh, goes into and in stocks and bonds and real estate and things that the insurance company manages. And there's universal life insurance, which is almost like um, uh, an insurance policy where you can also buy mutual funds within the policy. And there are generally different investment options you can choose from, and you've got more control over the investments that you purchase. Does it make sense, though, to separate the investment piece? Um, because I have to, and I know, I mean, there there is a cost to this, right? The premiums are much higher. So... I, and mm -hmm. The argument is often you should separate it unless there's a compelling tax saving strategy. Is that is that sure. right, or is there more to think about? I, I would say so. I would say for the vast majority of Canadians, um, you know, they have RSP room, they have TFSA room, they have other uh, tax shelters or investment opportunities they should be considering and maxing out before they buy a fancy life insurance policy. And beyond that, I find a lot of people are underinsured, particularly when it comes to other types of insurance, like disability insurance, for example. And if you've only got a limited insurance budget to use that on investments within an insurance policy, I think it's not appropriate. So there are some more sophisticated situations where maybe there's a case for these types of policies, but I think for 99% of uh, people term life insurance is probably the best type of life insurance for them to purchase. Okay. Uh, Jason, I want to get your thoughts on rule of thumbs because <laughs> I, I see this a lot, right? You, you hear this, um, the, the amount of coverage you should have is about 10 times your annual income for, for life insurance. I mean, I personally, I always question credibility of, <laughs> of advisors who throw out these numbers because every person's situation is unique. Um, how do you feel about rule of thumbs and, and how does one sort of figure out how much they need? Well, you know, I, I always caution against rules of thumb when it comes to financial planning decisions. Um, I think they're a good starting point, a good guideline. But ultimately, I think the type of insurance or, or the amount of insurance you should buy should be largely based on how much um, of a payout your spouse and or your children would need to stay financially independent and, and stay on track. And that's not necessarily replacing 100% of your future income. It's not necessarily a rule of thumb. It's not necessarily just to pay off your mortgage. Um, I like to come at it from the perspective of what would happen if you died? Would they stay in the same house? Would there be other costs like um, you know, uh, a nanny, for example, that might be necessary. Um, what would uh, the future expenses be for the family? And coming at it from a, an expense replacement or expense coverage perspective. So, um, you know, these rules of thumb, they're, they're a starting point, but I think it, it really needs to be based on what would happen and, and how could your family stay on track 
financially, how much money would be needed as a lump sum payment. Okay. Um, another 45 seconds for the next break. I, I just want to go back to the, the point that I made in the introduction. And with the cost of living going up, I, I know there's lots of people watching this who are going to be tempted to cancel um, their policies, right, to, to, to weather this storm. What's one thing they should be thinking about before they do it? Well, I think it's a, a legitimate risk. Um, at the end of the day, you know, most people during their um, working years are not going to die. There's there's a higher likelihood of becoming disabled, and unfortunately, disability insurance is the more expensive type of uh, of coverage. So, I think it's one of those uh, things that you need to to consider as a risk management tool and making sure that you're properly protected, even if it does mean you might need to sacrifice in other areas and absorb the cost at, at this time. Welcome back. I'm here with Jason Heath of Objective Financial Partners. Jason, before the break, we were talking about, you know, this this rise in, in the cost of living and how some people might be tempted to, to cancel their insurance. I guess the other side of it is, you know, should they be reevaluating their insurance policy with the costs of living going up? For sure. I, I think there's a case for reevaluating it and, and, you know, being a legitimate concern that those who are underinsured are, are becoming even more underinsured with the rising cost of living. And at the end of the day, life insurance is meant in large part to replace uh, your income so your financial dependents can cover their expenses uh, if you were to die. Disability insurance is meant to replace your income so that you can pay your own expenses if something were to happen to you and you became disabled. And as the cost of living rises, as mortgage interest rates rise for anybody who has debt, um, arguably there may be a need for higher insurance coverage. Or again, those who are underinsured are, are you know, perhaps more underinsured if they don't have enough coverage in the first place. So. I think the rising cost of living, if anything, has a, a slight um, uh, impact requiring more insurance coverage as opposed to, to less. And um, at the end of the day, anybody who's going without insurance is taking a, a financial risk. Okay. Let's talk about insurance in um, in particular for retirees when they're retiring, right? Do they need Do they need life insurance? And how do they go about evaluating the type of health insurance they need? Because typically, um, you know, some might get a, a policy, like it's a, it's a group policy where they can save money, but that's not as common as it, as it used to yeah. be. Yeah. For sure. So on the life insurance side, I would say that most people, by the time they've retired, if they're financially uh, independent, they probably don't, you know, quote unquote, need life insurance anymore from a risk management perspective. Um, if somebody has an insurance policy and their health is poor, um, there may be a reason to keep the life insurance and, and renew it or convert it into a permanent life insurance policy because they know their health is poor and keeping the policy might provide a, a larger estate value to their family and their beneficiaries than canceling the policy. But if somebody's in good health, uh, they probably don't need life insurance anymore by the time retirement comes. And I think the whole concept of keeping insurance or buying insurance to pay income taxes is questionable. If somebody's got an extraordinary situation, like they own a, a business or something that's very illiquid, where there's going to be a, a whole bunch of tax to pay, that might be a situation to, to have um, you know insurance in place. But Buying or keeping life insurance to pay the tax on your RSP, for example, I find is not an appropriate strategy. You know, the money that you pay in premiums, if you just kept that money invested, you may well end up with the same or more money to eventually have your estate pay the tax on your RSP. Um, on health insurance, health insurance is a, is a real interesting one. And I get that question a lot from people who want to know if they should go out and buy a private health insurance policy. Yeah. And the way I look at it, if you've got a group policy that you're a member of, ideally you want to be a heavy user in a company where lots of other people are not using the coverage. And then you might come out ahead. You might get more back from the insurance company than you pay in. But a private health insurance policy when you're in retirement, 
generally speaking, if you think about it, the, the insurance company needs to take more in than they pay out in order to stay solvent. So it's not very likely that a health insurance policy in retirement is going to come out ahead financially for people. And I think most people are better off self-insuring and, and just paying out of pocket, particularly the fact that the big risk in retirement is long-term care cost is not a broken filling. Yeah. And, and when we talk about health costs, we're talking about, you know, covering dental or medical, uh, very different than disability sure. and, and critical insurance. Obviously, disability is not something you would get if you're retired, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, health, health insurance that that replaces your glasses or, or, you know, goes towards your orthotics. I mean, you know, usually that's got annual limits in terms of what you can get back. The premiums are calculated in large part based on the likelihood of you claiming on certain things and, and how much you can get back. So there's really a limited benefit. Um, health, uh, medical and dental costs, other than maybe prescription costs, are not likely to make or break you in, in retirement. Long-term care costs, again, there, there's long-term care insurance that... Yeah people can buy, but a, a typical health and dental policy is going to have limited benefit for, okay. for people. So. Okay, we'll take another uh, break and we'll continue this conversation. Welcome back. Our guest is Jason Heath. Um, Jason, we've been talking about health insurance now and um, can you explain to viewers how disability insurance works? Sure. So a disability insurance policy is generally something you buy when you are working. And disability insurance, if you become disabled and you can't work, will pay you a monthly benefit that is effectively meant to replace your income or at least part of it. Um, some group policies will pay a percentage of your salary um, some policies just pay a monthly benefit that's a set dollar amount. Um, and as long as uh, you are making the, the payments and paying the premiums on your disability insurance policy, the insurance payout is tax free. But an important nuance, if your employer is paying the premiums uh, and you have to collect on a disability insurance policy, the income is actually taxable to you. So on an after-tax basis, you may not keep as much, but basically it's income replacement insurance. Okay, and yeah, so you bring up an important point because it's really important to read the policy, right? Um, the, the fine details, because I, I from my For understanding, sure. it also depends on the type of work you do. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's policies uh, as well, and this is common with private policies and group policies that after a certain period of time, um, often after two years, if the insurance company determines that you are able to do um, some other job, not necessarily your job that you were doing, they uh, may be able to reduce or stop paying the um, uh, monthly insurance benefit. So there are policies that are more uh, ironclad, I suppose, that protect you in the event you're not able to do your own occupation. You're not able to continue doing exactly what you're doing before you became disabled. So I think it's really important to look at that fine print. And especially for group policies, a lot of group policies that replace a percentage of your income. If you're a, a high income earner, a lot of group policies will have um, a relatively low monthly benefit that um, might not replace anywhere near your full salary. Uh, okay, so enter critical insurance. Uh, you know, I know it works different, but it, it can also be supplementary to disability, mm -hmm. can't it? Can you explain? For sure. Insurance? So yeah. critical illness insurance is uh, a type of insurance that in the event you develop uh, a critical illness, and generally speaking, uh, most policies have a, a list of about 25 different critical illnesses, cancer, heart attack, stroke, things like that being the big ones. If you have the onset of a critical illness, and generally speaking, if you're still alive 30 days later, um, there's a lump sum payout, a set dollar amount that will be paid to you that you can use however you want. You can use it to pay for expenses. You can use it for um, income replacement. 
Uh, it's one of those types of insurance that I think is more optional, I suppose, because if you have a critical illness that's very serious, that leads to a death, your life insurance will pay out. If you have uh, a disability, or I'm sorry, you have a critical illness that causes you to be disabled and, and qualify for disability income, your disability insurance will kick in. So there might be some instances where critical illness is sort of a duplication of coverage, but there's also a lot of cases where having that extra money would be super handy to pay for extraordinary costs like extra help around the house, maybe your spouse would take um, an unpaid leave of absence to be there for you while you were dealing with a critical illness. So mm. uh, it's an optional coverage, but it's a, a neat option for people to consider as well. Okay, uh, we only have 40 seconds till the end of the show, Jason. So for those who are watching this and, and, and if they don't have insurance, what's a good place to start? What should they do first? Yeah, good question. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd like to say speak to uh, an insurance agent, but it's a bit of a double edged sword. You know, insurance agents uh, sell insurance. So, you know, generally speaking, when you speak to them, you're going to get an insurance solution. Um, you know, some insurance agents specialize in life insurance and are more inclined to focus on uh, fancier types of life insurance products and may not be as well versed in disability insurance, which again is is the area where I tend to see most people are are underinsured. Okay. So I think it's speaking to a financial professional, First. trying to sit down and do a little number crunching on your own, okay. uh, and determine if and and where you might be underinsured or or whether you're overinsured for that matter. Okay, Jason, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Angel. Well, that wraps up this edition of Strictly Money. You can catch previous episodes of the show on the newsforum.ca or follow me on Facebook at. Sage L. Stay well, stay wise, and stay wealthy. Thanks for watching.